Well, good morning and welcome to First Presbyterian Church here in Walnut Ridge. If, if you haven't met me yet, my name is John Arnold and I am the pastor here. Super excited about today's worship and also announcements that I have because the session met this last week and after looking at what a precipitous drop we have seen in cases in our county, looking at the number of folks we have who have been vaccinated within our church, uh, we have decided to go ahead and resume many of our normal activities. So, what does that mean practically? Well, yoga this week I'm going to continue to do online. We didn't discuss that one, and we have some uh, repair work we're doing in the fellowship hall. So we'll, this week at least, continue to meet for yoga online at 6.30. Uh, we will have resume Sunday school. Uh, Sunday school will be 9.45 on Sunday mornings, and that will begin on the 18th. So a week from today, we will resume Sunday school at 9.45. Right now, the plan is to go back and re-examine the book of Ecclesiastes. That was a study we did a little over a year ago, and people absolutely loved that study and said, I would like to do it again and expose more folks to it. So. I will put the word out there. Now that said, that's the plan right now. I am going to do a little bit of shopping around this week and see if I run into something else. But for now, that's where we're headed. I will put the word out with particulars on our uh, church website and the Facebook page later in the week. But either way, come this time next week, 9.45 a.m., we will be gathered in Sunday school once again, which is going to be awesome. Um, on the 30th, I believe that's correct, let me check my date. Yeah, Friday, April 30th, we will have our first children's ministry event that we have had in over a year. That's like hard to imagine. So we will gather for energizers, uh, uh, Bible story, music, things we used to know and love and do in kids' ministry. We will be gathered back together for that. And we will also, at the beginning of May, the first Wednesday of May, have our first church night supper. We're going to try doing it at 6 o'clock and see how that works for folks. Uh, we've played around with time before in the past. It was 6.30. We're going to try out 6 o'clock and see how that goes. Since it happens to be Cinco de Mayo, which will make it easy to remember, uh, we're going to encourage people to bring uh, something that is like a Mexican food dish, and we'll sort of play up that theme at that time. Uh, I think that's about it. That's a lot. I will prompt you uh, over the weeks to come, remind you as we get closer to those, but since these are all fresh and new on the calendar, I want you to mark them down now so that you know that they are coming. So there you have it. Now, we will continue to offer worship online. That may change up a little bit as I resume things like Sunday school and other activities. I might change what the online service looks like. Uh, we'll wait and see. But for now, just know that there will always be an online option for the foreseeable future for anyone who cannot attend worship or that you just live far away from us and you enjoy worshiping with us. We absolutely love having you. So. That's all I have. Um, let's go ahead and begin to prepare our hearts and minds for worship and bring our minds together as a community to where we're not, even though we may be sitting in our homes far apart from one another, or I'm standing in this sanctuary by myself right now, we're not alone. We're, we are in spirit and we are in community with one another united through God's Holy Spirit, through one faith, one hope, one baptism, one spirit. What a beautiful blessing that is. Uh, I would also, in, in, that, uh, in that spirit of unity, let's collectively take a big breath together. If you would, inhale with me. And then exhale. And take that moment to just let go of anything. It's kind of clinging to you to set it at God's feet, if you will and to make yourself wholly available for worship, listening deeply to his word, praying intently the prayers that we pray, singing with joy and gratitude, 
100% being invested in worship because God is always 100% invested in us. And this is our opportunity to say thank you, to re-engage, to be open to the Spirit. So let us now listen to our prelude and get in a state of just feeling near to God because the Word tells us if we draw near to God, God will draw near to us. join me in a call to worship. Peace be with you. How good and pleasant it is when we live together in unity. Receive the Holy Spirit. It is like precious oil on the head, the blessing of the Lord. And let's sing together now our opening hymn, To God Be the Glory. as we'll see in the witness of Scripture today, that Jesus Christ came that we might believe in Him as the Messiah, 
the one who comes to save us, and the Son of God, this, this man who is divine and who is the Word made flesh for a purpose that we might have eternal life if we just believe. And one of the things that we do when we believe is we recognize our need to be saved, that we sin and we fall short of the glory of God, and that we can call out to God and we can ask for forgiveness. And because of Jesus Christ's death and resurrection, we may receive it. In that, in that, with that mindset and heart about us, I invite you to confess your sins with me, saying, You have shown yourself to us, O God, by word and spirit, with signs and wonders, in flesh and blood. Yet we still struggle to live and believe the good news of Jesus Christ. Have mercy on us. Forgive us. Enter into our lives and cast out our fear so that we may come to trust in you and have life in Jesus' name. And hear now our silent confessions to you. Amen. And listen and take comfort to these words. We have an advocate with God, Jesus Christ, the Righteous One, who offered His life and love to save the world from sin. This is the good news of the Gospel. In Jesus Christ we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Let's honor God with joyful hearts for the forgiveness we've received by singing together the Gloria Patri. I invite you to join with me in affirming what we believe today by reading together the Apostles' Creed, saying, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let's pause in prayer before we look at God's holy word this morning. God, we ask your spirit to illuminate your word for us today that we might have greater belief. And in having greater belief, have greater life. We thank you for the gift of your son, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Our Old Testament reading this morning is from the Psalms. We're going to be reading Psalm 133. I invite you now to listen to God's holy word. How very good and pleasant it is when kindred live together in unity. It's like the precious oil on the head running down upon the beard, on the beard of Aaron. Running down over the collar of his robes, it is like the dew of Hermon, which falls on the mountains of Zion, for there the Lord ordained his blessing, life forevermore. And then we are reading out of the Gospel of John this morning, chapter 20, verses 19 through 31. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked 
for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side, and then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house. Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, "Put Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand, put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So much of the time when we look at this passage, we're kind of hyper fixated on Thomas, right? Uh, In fact, some Bibles, if you open it up, they would put the heading above the passage, Doubting Thomas, though that uh, reference to him never actually comes up in Scripture. It's one that we have appended on him forever, and it's what people first and foremost think of of Thomas and of this passage. And I, I feel like when we spend so much time fixated on Thomas's doubt that we almost miss really the importance and the focus of the passage in a much bigger, bigger way. Uh, it reminds me of, there's a story of a man who was, he had a dog and he taught his dog this amazing trick, a trick no other dog had done before. And someone was walking, he was out on the beach with his dog, and someone was walking along, and he said, I've got to show you this. I'm going to show you a trick that my dog can do that no other dog can do. Watch this. And he takes this piece of driftwood, and he wings it out into the ocean, and the dog goes running for the water, and he runs on top of the water, not getting a drop wet, picks up the stick, runs back, and hands it to him. And the guy watching is just kind of like, Okay, so what? So he's going, well, hang on, let me do it again. He throws the stick out there, the dog goes running out there, runs on top of the water, and never gets wet, picks up that stick, comes running back on the water, hands him the stick, sits down there obediently, ready to go again. And the guy looks at him and is still like, I mean, so? And he goes, didn't you notice anything like out of the ordinary? And the guy goes, your, your dog can't swim? And that's, you know, it's like, totally misses the point here, you know. Your dog cannot swim. No, that is not the point. It's not about my dog not swimming. The dog can miraculously walk on water, people. Um, And I I lift that up because this morning, in the way we treat this passage, a lot of time we spend, and we do this with miracle stories a lot of times. We totally don't talk about a miracle. We talk about you know, something going on among the people or debate with the Pharisees or whatever. We just, we don't even slow down for the, the whole thing being a testimony to something absolutely astounding and miraculous. This passage shouldn't be called the Doubting Thomas passage. It should be the story of the undeniably real, alive Jesus or something like that. And the text itself even kind of tells us to do that because we get to the end, we get down to the very last verses, and it says, listen, these things have been written, I'm going to paraphrase here, 
Jesus did a whole lot more than this, and it was seen by the disciples. But these, these particular ones, I've written them down so you'll believe. And so you believe that Jesus is the Messiah, he is the Son of God, and in believing that you're going to have life in his name. And this is pivotal text. It tells you exactly why the story is given to us and what we should be focused on. What does this tell us about Jesus? Why is this passage important about belief? What does it urge us to believe? And more importantly, even than that, is what kind of belief do we have? And I want to lift up today kind of two types of belief that we could fall into and urge you to fall into the latter. The first one is what I would call informational belief, where we believe something for, we sort of intellectually assent to something and say, okay, yeah, that's true. And then what I would call formational or transformational belief, where we believe something in, it, in a way that actually shapes our identity, it shapes our behavior, it changes us. Because that's what belief in Jesus Christ is all about. That's what the whole Gospel of John is about. The Gospel of John lifts up the word believe, depending on who, which commentator you look up, over a hundred times. People come up with different counts. I myself have not gone through it and looked up the word pistuo, which we translate as belief. I have not looked it up, but well over a hundred times. The bottom line of it is this. It's actually twice as much as the whole rest of the New Testament, the word comes up. It is more than it comes up in the other three Gospels combined. John is all about people believing. And it words all over this story. It's all about belief. And it's a belief that should change and transform us, not just be something we give intellectual assent to. For the disciples, at first, just we'll ignore Thomas for just a moment. In the beginning of this, it says, on that day. They're talking about the day that Mary went to the tomb, a couple of the other disciples, and some of the women went to the tomb, and they found it empty, and Mary encountered Jesus and came back and told them, like, this is early in the morning that happens. She comes and she tells the disciples, Jesus is alive. And they're confused by it. They don't know what to think. They don't know what to believe. That's why Peter and another disciple run to the tomb to check it out for themselves. We're told that once they see it's empty, they then do begin to believe. Uh, but, but they come back, and even though they may be starting to believe, we're, they're locked behind closed doors out of fear for the Jews, is what the text tells us. They're still concerned that the um, that the authorities are maybe going to come for them as well, and they're hiding out in the upper room. They've locked the doors, and you know they're just hunkering down in fear, probably desperation, wondering what in the world do we do next. So, if they believe, it really hasn't hit them at a heart level where it's changed anything for them. They're still in a kind of a lost, fearful space. And when Jesus comes into their midst and they see and believe, it has an impact on them, has a transformational effect. They don't just go, oh, Mary, you were right. Sorry, I was wrong. He is alive. Okay, it's not informational for them. They're not like, okay, check it off. Was wrong about that. Now it's, now we know it really is true. He's alive. No, we're actually told that immediately what happens is, is that their fear turns to gladness. So it has this emotive impact on them. It changes the affect of who they are, what they're feeling, how they're responding to their experience of life right now. goes from fear to gladness. We're told that he tells them, you know, I've come, he breathes on them, he gives them a gift of the Holy Spirit, and he's going to send them the way he was sent. And so it, he comes, and their encounter with him results, and now we have like a mission again. We're on the road. He's come to send us. And so it has a transformative effect on their identity in that no longer are we these grieving, closed-off people, but we're going to be a giving, going people in the name of the Lord. And then we have Thomas. Thomas 
miss us out on this. And then it's an entire week where he's the odd man out, where everybody else is seen, everybody else believes, and they are behind closed doors. And Thomas finally gets to see. And when he does, he believes. And once again, it has a transformative impact on him. Because he go, it's not just informational. He doesn't say, like a, the disciples could have with Mary, he doesn't just look at him and go, okay, I believe it now. That's true. Jesus is alive. Let's go back to life as usual. No. He actually, he, he makes this exclamation, my God and my Lord. And if you really slow down and think about that, you know, when something is your God, it is that which has foremost uh, value for you, foremost authority for you. And when he says, my Lord, he is humbling self. He's submitting himself. He's taking on the role of a servant because you don't call somebody Lord unless they're, you're their servant and you're subservient to them and you're submitting your will to them. So it is completely transformative of Thomas, who he is. Not, it's not just information taken in. And I think far too often in Christianity, we read stories, we take things in, and we kind of mentally check off a checkbox of, yeah, I believe in the resurrection. I think that could have happened. And not go from there to the place of Thomas of saying, I believe, and that changes everything. Because now I have a God and a God who is mighty and has overcome death and has overcome sin. I believe, and I'm going to live life differently now, and I'm going to have life in the name of Jesus Christ. This is not just a hypothetical like college room discussion of, do you think God exists or not? Yes, I do. No, I don't. Well, let's go on with life as usual. No. These stories are intended so that we can see people who witness Jesus firsthand and from their experience hopefully come to believe on our own and come into an encounter with Jesus Christ of our own so that we might believe and have and it have a transformational impact. All through the Gospel of John, when, it, when you read verses, it, it doesn't just lift up a verse and state something as a fact to believe in. Many, many, many times it lifts up that that belief is to lead to something. I'm just going to share a few verses to give you some examples of that. Um, now, Jesus did many other signs. This is from the text, and I just want to remind us of it. This is from John 20. Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciple, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ. He's the Messiah. He's God's anointed one. Anointed one, the Christ was one who came. They were in an intermediary role between God and the people, and they were in a salvific role uh, for God for God, for the people, uh, that he's the Son of God, big theme throughout John. He is the Word made flesh. He is uh, a man God. He is divine, and yet he's human. And we see that. That's important in this particular story. Like, he wants people to understand. Jesus, John's not just seeing, I mean, um, Thomas is not just seeing a, he's not having a hallucination, it's not a ghost. He's physically there. It's not someone other than Jesus. He can see the actual wounds on him, the wounds in his side. You know, this is a loaded passage because this passage helps in some ways alleviate some of the, the doubts or the, um, the things that people might lift up as objections, right? Well, what it... Maybe Thomas just uh, imagined this, or maybe just Thomas was having hallucination, or maybe it was a spirit and Jesus isn't bodily resurrected. No, we're told, like, he felt him. He laid his hands on him. He's physically alive. Well, you know, okay, so the disciples think they saw him once, but did anybody else see him? Yes, a week later, John saw him, yet again in the presence of the disciples. These were not isolated incidents. Wasn't one incident, 
And when it happened, it wasn't isolated. It's not the witness of a person uncorroborated by other people. So it's really important, the details here. It goes on, we might believe Christ the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. Okay, let's look at a couple more. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son that whoever believes in him should what? Not perish, but have eternal life. That's formational belief. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Another testimony from John, first chapter, that in believing, we have an identity transformation from being children of something other than God, children of the flesh, <laughs> to children of God, where we are part of God's kingdom. We are, we are part, we have a new citizenship and a new family because of our belief. Let not, and here's John 14, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. Now that doesn't point out a specific like, okay, believe in this will happen. But what's inherent in that was the idea is that in believing, our hearts are going to stop being troubled, that we're going to find peace in believing, that it's going to take us from, like the disciples, being living in a place of fear of our circumstances to gladness in the midst of our circumstances. Uh, going on, truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but is passed from death to life. So this has an eternal impact. We saw that in John 3 that we read a moment ago. It gets repeated, it gets reinforced throughout the Gospel of John. Uh, similarly, around everlasting life, Jesus said, and this is Jesus talking to someone now, this is Jesus' witness, I am the resurrection and life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet he shall live. So those are just a few, and there are many, many more. I have several others here. I'm just going to lift up one last one. And this is from John 14. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or else believe on account of the works themselves. So he's saying, you know, like, you can believe me. That's one witness we have in the Gospel of John. You can believe my works. Look at what I've done. Do my works give validity to the claims I've made? Do these miracles speak to the fact that I'm divine? Or we have the witness of the disciples, not reflected in this passage, but in the other stories in the story we read today. He says, truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do, and greater works than these will he do, because I'm going to the Father. So again, we are given a mission, if you will. We will be doing works. We, it will transform who we are and what we do with our lives when we believe. So I would, I would challenge you to look at your faith. What kind of faith do you have? Do you have a faith where it's purely been informational? Or have you, at some level, encountered God so that it is formational? And if you haven't, okay, here's the thing. I don't want to beat you up. That's not the point of this. I'm not saying that so I can go, well, shame on you. You just need to believe more. That is not the point at all. What I want to say is this. That's okay, because God is a big enough God to handle our doubts, and if we draw near to Him, He will draw near to us, just as I said at the beginning of this worship. I would encourage you, if you have doubts, even if, and particularly maybe if you've believed really strongly in the past, sometimes people believe, have a vibrant relationship with God, and they go through something test, that tests their faith, or they just grow very, very far apart from God. And I, I'm somewhat concerned that maybe in this pandemic, people who had the reinforcement of being able to gather together, because a lot of times that's where we see and learn and grow in our faith, have maybe found themselves drifting away from God and not feeling as vibrant and strong a connection and belief as they once had. If that's where you are, I would encourage you to just Boldly be honest with that doubt and unbelief. That's what Thomas did, right? Well, this is where I am. You know, like, 
I really want to see and believe, but this is kind of what I need. And, and put that out there. Be honest before God with the doubts and the concerns you have. I would encourage you to be in fellowship with other people somehow. Even if you are still not able to go in person to worship, whether it's over the phone or through Zoom calls with friends or with family who have a faith, continue to be in fellowship and gather somehow in the name of Christ. I want you to notice that Jesus, both for Thomas and the disciples, this experience happened within community. And Scripture actually talks about where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am in the midst of them. Now, can and does God reveal Himself to people while they're on their own? Absolutely. We have stories that testify to that in Scripture, and there are probably people you know who can talk about moments where God touched their life while nobody was around in big ways. It's happened for me multiple occasions. The only reason I say be in community is, I feel like it greatly increases the chances of that happening, that when we are in community, that there is so much encouragement that can happen, and we can have the witness of others who have experiences to help us in our own faith. Because it can happen to us all. Thomas was not necessarily a doubtful person by his nature, I don't believe. If we were to go back in the gospel and look earlier, what we would find, there was a point where, at one point, Jesus was going to go somewhere, and all the other disciples didn't want to go because they're like, you know, they're going to stone you there. We don't want to go back there. They're going to stone you there. And Thomas was the guy who stepped up and said, listen, even if we die, let's go. I'm, I'll go with the Lord to die. Like, there was no doubt there. But he had been through something tragic. He'd been something horrible. He watched, his, he watched his Lord, his Savior, his hope get crucified. And it just pulled the rug out from under his feet. And sometimes, even if we're strong believers, something can happen that's so dramatic and painful to us that it causes doubts. That's just part of the human journey, even for people with tremendous faith. We could go back and look at the story of John the Baptist. John the Baptist an amazing, fiery man for God. At one point, he is kinfolk to Jesus. He's one of the first people to proclaim the divinity of Jesus, if you will. He's there at his baptism, participates in his baptism, sees God say, this is my son, and whom I'm well pleased. So like he's got all this firsthand knowledge. And yet there was a point where John the Baptist when he was arrested and he was placed in prison, he found himself saying to Jesus' disciples, you know, well, he, he asked his disciples to go to Jesus and ask him if he was the Messiah or not. So he, had, he came to a place while he was there where he had grievous doubts of something that he was, I have no doubt, rock solid on before. So if you doubt that's part of a life of faith. It happens. It's okay. But don't stay there. Don't, don't be stuck there. Take time to draw near to God and preferably draw near to God in the presence and the companionship, the fellowship of other believers. Because sometimes they are the ones who give witness so that you're able to believe when you don't feel like believing. I know I need that, and I'm sure there's going to be times in your life, if you haven't experienced that before, you will if you are on a road of faith, because it's just part of the human journey. We have doubts at times, and it's really okay. God is big enough to bear them. So my prayer for you, and I wrap up with this, my prayer for you is that with each bit of evidence that you encounter, whether it's something God does in your life or a witness of someone else or a witness of Scripture or the witness of this worship, with each encounter, you move steadily closer and closer to a formational, a transformational belief than purely an informational belief. Praise be to God that we have a God who is patient with our doubts and brings us evidence that we might believe.
Amen, and please join me in prayer. Most holy God, for a moment we pause and we take whatever is maybe something we're struggling with, Lord, and we lift it up to you. I'm going to be quiet for a few moments and people can just take what is their, their physical need that like Thomas had. Where is it maybe where they're struggling? Maybe it's a prayer that they have lifted up and that you don't seem to be responding to, so they're really struggling with that. Uh, maybe it is something that's happened and they're struggling because they're like, how can you be real and this be happening? I'm sure the disciples felt that way around the uh, crucifixion. So hear now, God, the yearning of our heart to believe in the midst of our doubts. We lift them up to you now. Lord God, we give you thanks and praise that we, because of your Son, are your children, that we are citizens of your kingdom. We give you thanks that we have a life that has a positive mission to it, that we can bring good news to others that can change their lives. We give you thanks that your Son was willing to be obedient enough that he would suffer death on a cross for our behalf so that we might have life. For all these things and many, many more, we give you thanks and praise. And then lastly, we come before you with words that your son Jesus taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Now is a time in worship where we have the opportunity to honor God for all God's goodness to us. And we can do that by giving to support the ministry of His church here at Walnut Ridge and our touch, if you will, of ministry goes beyond just these four walls. So when you give here, it has a bigger footprint than you might imagine. Uh, there are two ways that you can give to support ministry here. One is you can mail a check to P.O. Box 214, Walnut Ridge, Arkansas, 72476. Um, you can also go online and you can give via our website. You just go to fpcwalnutridge.org forward slash give and click on the button you'll see there to donate, fill in the information, and that is a place that is secure, so it's a safe way to give, and it is a tax-deductible contribution, whether you mail that check in or if you do it online. It's quick and easy enough that you could even do it from your phone. So. In advance, I want to thank you very much for your support, and together I would invite us to honor God for all His good gifts by singing together the doxology. Let's join together in asking God's blessing upon the gifts that we offer Him today. Let us pray. Most holy God, these tangible gifts can result in intangible results. They can mean that someone hears the Word of God and comes to greater belief, and in so doing, has a completely different life. Such an amazing thing to come from a seed sown by giving a check or pressing a few buttons on a website. 
It's a miraculous, Lord, what can happen in people's lives when we are willing to be faithful with a little. Because you are a God who can bless things so that they multiply and they have a bigger impact than we could ask or imagine. To that end, Lord, we offer these gifts and, and plead for you to touch these gifts that they might become a blessing. In Christ's name we pray these things. Amen. I would invite you to sing with me our closing hymn, Be Thou My Vision. Thank you so much for worshiping with us this week. I hope to see you in person sometime, either in worship or some of these activities that are now resuming. That would be an awesome blessing because, again, when we are gathered together, there is greater opportunity and possibility that we will encounter the risen Jesus Christ and come to greater belief. Why well, would charge you to not be passive about your faith, but to be like Thomas, to, to be resolutely determined to not just accept what you've been told, but to really examine it and look for the evidence so that you might believe in a very active way, not just sort of taking on what's been told to you, but come to a belief that results in a deeper relationship with Jesus Christ, one where you can look at him and say, not just, well, I believe there is a God, but you can say, my God and my Lord. My God and my Lord. And as you do so, may the love of God the Father, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ bless you abundantly. And all God's children said, Amen.